All right, uh, world history students, we are on our last lecture for unit one on the ancient Near East, and we're going to go ahead and be covering um, uh, three of the other uh, major civilizations that arise after the, uh, the, the kingdom of Israel. And so we're going to be talking about Assyria, Babylon, and Persia. Let's go ahead and jump right in. All righty. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The reason I start off with this, and you'll be doing another slide on this, is because it was in this dream that uh, God foretold to the prophet Daniel and also Nebuchadnezzar uh, the coming of several kingdoms, five different kingdoms, one after another. Um, and so the, the, this takes place while the Jews are in exile in Babylon right around 586 B.C. Um, and so Nebuchadnezzar has this dream of a giant statue made of all these different um, uh, materials. Um, and then the collapse of that statue, and he goes to his astronomers, who we'll talk about later in this lecture, and he said they can't interpret his dream. Um, and so instead he finds Daniel, uh, who's among the Jewish exiles living in Babylon now, um, because Jerusalem has been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, and he interprets uh, the dream. Uh, and so that's the, that's the summary of that statue is right here, where it had a head of gold, a breast of silver, thighs of brass, uh, legs of iron, and feet in clay. Uh, of, I'm sorry, feet of iron and clay. And so the main idea is that each of these sections represented, as Daniel comes in and prof, uh, interprets the dream, uh, different uh, kingdoms and how different kingdoms would rise and then fall, rise and then fall, and conquer each other one after another. Um, and so historically, uh, we, could, we we've been able to match these kingdoms up to, uh, first of all, Babylon at the top, uh, which is later conquered by uh, Persia, um, which is then going to be conquered by Greece, uh, which then falls to Rome. Uh, then, when, then which uh, divides into the various nations of Western Europe. Now, uh, the, the, the feet especially, sometimes there's a little more contention over what they exactly represent because Rome, um, some people say Rome was both uh, Republican Rome and then uh, uh, Imperial Rome. But anyway, all that aside, uh, the idea is that it provides a prophecy because this was, this was put out in the, uh, again, in, in the 6th century B.C., of the future of of asia and europe of the mighty uh empires that would rule and so it's a powerful uh roadmap to where we're going to be going uh this quarter and then into the second quarter looking at all of these uh nations uh the uh two of them uh, babylon and persia right now um the other important part of the dream uh, that you can talk about more when we we'll talk about more when we have class is of course the stone not hewn by human hand uh which comes and hits the base of the statue and causes it to collapse. And then that tiny stone becomes a mountain that fills the entire earth, um, uh, representing the kingdom of God. And they said, not only are these man-made kingdoms going to succeed one after another, conquering each other and replacing each other, but eventually all of them are going to fall and turn to dust in the face of an even greater kingdom, not built by men, uh, but built by God, uh, that's going to, in fact, fill the entire earth. So a uh, powerful uh, message about God's relationship between him and the other kingdoms of the world, uh, uh, basically saying, look, many, again, like the Sumerians or the Egyptians, they saw the specific God as saying, I'm in favor of your kingdom, Egypt, or I'm in favor of your kingdom, uh, Sumeria, or I'm in favor of your kingdom, Babylon. And this prophecy was really a kind of a, a bit of a wake up call or, or again, a diversion where the Jews said, you know what, he's our God, but he's not behind any one kingdom. He's got his own kingdom. And even the kingdom of Israel, he doesn't protect it forever. It falls. Um, because God's kingdom is something different. What God's trying to accomplish on this earth is different than what men, and again, the statues, as it were, that they build to themselves. And so we'll talk about that more on Wednesday, but it's a really, again, a very important divergence of how the Jews basically said God is in total control of these kingdoms, and he's not for or against any one kingdom. He's for his own kingdom, and he'll do, he'll orchestrate events, and he'll orchestrate the rise and fall of various peoples in order to accomplish uh, his, 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 um, his goals. So let's talk first about Assyria, and these are listed in chronological order, but really that the nation of Israel had interaction, key interactions um, documented in the Bible, the Old Testament, uh, with three major empires. Um, we've already talked about a fourth one, Egypt, and so now we'll, we'll jump to Assyria. Uh, the capital of Assyria is the famous Nineveh of Jonah lore. It is the, um, it's up kind of, if you look at the Fertile Crescent, it's up at the top of the Fertile Crescent. Actually, I think we have a map right there. You can see Nineveh up on the, the banks of the Tigris River. Um, that is where Jonah was told to go uh, call them to repent. Um, he didn't want to. Why? Because Assyrians were historical enemies of the Jews. In fact, they did a, a committed a lot of atrocities to the, against the Jews and conquered them, as we'll talk about in a minute. And so he didn't want to have anything to do with them. Eventually, he does go after the fish and all that. 
um, and they do repent. And this for that, at least for that time, uh, the the city of Nineveh is spared. Um, key uh, key rulers of Nineveh. Uh, one is Sargon the second. Notice he's named himself after Sargon the Great, the first uh, uniter of the Sumerian city states. Um, and then we have uh, Sennacherib and Tiglath uh, Peleser, however you pronounce that. But Sennacherib is is famous because he is going to be the Assyrian ruler who conquers uh, the northern ten tribes of Israel, and uh, um, and then fail to conquer the south. And then Tiglath Peleser is going to come along and also help. Uh, uh, basically remove and relocate those 10 tribes so that they can never again, they kind of lose their Jewish heritage. So there we go. We have a map here. Notice um, the Fertile Crescent. That's the traditional territory that was fertile and usable and that would be conquered by these nations. Um, looks a lot like Sumer, but notice it's bigger than Sumer because it extends into the Promised Land there by Damascus, Palestine, Jerusalem. Um, and then down also at one point they control even Egypt. And so we're, we, at this time, Assyria is the largest uh, world empire that we've seen yet. Um, I will point out, notice Jerusalem itself is not conquered. And that is because, as I, I, I stated, um, the Assyrians under Sennacherib conquer 10 of the 12 tribes um, and their land in the Promised Land, but they fail. Um, they're mirac miraculously defeated outside the gates of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is never itself, the city itself and the tribe of Judah, they're never conquered um, by the Assyrians. Uh, depictions of the capital of Nineveh along the banks of the Euphrates River. Again, you can see some similarities to the previous ziggurat structures of the Sumerians who came before them. Um, and so as I've been alluding to in 722, um, the northern part of Israel is destroyed. Um, if you know your, your history of Israel and you watched that short video from last week, Israel was split in half. They had a civil war following the reign of Solomon and 10 of the tribes were called Israel in the north, sometimes they were called Samaria. Um, that was their capital city, Samaria. And the south was just two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. Um, and so the, they actually, if you read, the, the, the kings of the north are more wicked than the kings of the south. And Samaria, uh, I'm sorry, Assyria comes in and conquers Samaria in 722. It destroys their capital. It deports uh, Sennacherib and then Tiglath Peleser. They deport the Jews and they basically destroy their Jewish heritage. They're no, they don't allow them to maintain their the covenant that god had played with place before them their rituals of worship they don't have a tabernacle they don't have a temple and so they basically integrate and kind of lose their identity within the various peoples that they get relocated to live among and so they become known as the ten lost tribes uh, this is a relief of an assyrian palace in which it shows assyrian troops with kind of that they have the, the famous coned or pointed helmets um, and what they're doing is they're dashing or killing uh, jewish prisoners banging them slamming them up against a wall um, in order to, until they're dead. Uh, the Jews, if you notice, are actually depicted as having the kind of the curly, short curly head and curly haired uh, beards, kind of as a caricature. Um, Assyria does try to conquer the last two tribes, Judah and, and Benjamin in the south. They lay siege to the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem's um, incredibly outnumbered. Um, and this is where if you read in, in uh, the accounts of Kings and Chronicles that uh, the king Sennacherib mocks the God of Israel, basically saying the God of the gods of all the other nations I've conquered, none of them have saved them, and so your God's not going to save you either. Um, and God decides to, through the prophet um, Isaiah, uh, prophet Isaiah, to say, you know what? Um, I'm going to fight for you, Judah. I'm going to save you. And so then uh, it says the angel of death came down and killed tens or hundreds of thousands of their troops in one night. And what we know historically to be true is that the for for reasons that no no that aren't stated that the king of, of Assyria basically decided to turn around and leave Jerusalem. Just they, It was in the middle of a siege. Uh, they were wearing out, they were running out of supplies. They were winning the siege, and all of a sudden they just decided to leave. And Jer Jerusalem is never conquered by uh, the Assyrians. So again, a really a historical and also biblical account that we have multiple confirmations of. Um, the key thing about this uh, incredible salvation is that because uh, Jerusalem saved, the Torah is preserved. The, the practice, as I've already said, there's really no remnant of much of the 10 tribes, they didn't preserve their Jewish heritage. And had Sennacherib been able to breach the walls of Jerusalem and destroy the temple and destroy and relocate them like the other 10 tribes, um, it's very likely um, that we would not have Jews today. They would not have been able to preserve their covenant. There would have been no locus for Jewish uh, worship or Jewish culture or Jewish government. Um, and so this is considered one of the big turning points in history, the fact that 
Sennacherib and the Assyrians failed to conquer Jerusalem. And you can see that the picture is, again, another palace frieze showing uh, a siege tower going up against a, a tower in Jerusalem. I, there might actually be a frieze of them sieging a different city um, besides Jerusalem. And you get those things up in the air, spears and arrows, uh, depictions of, of, again, siege combat where they had the city surrounded. Okay, so Assyria conquers the north of Israel, uh, fails to conquer Jerusalem and the south, and then they themselves fall to an even mightier empire, the Neo-Babylonian Empire. They call themselves the Neo-Babylonian Empire because they were hearkening back to uh, the Sumerian Empire under rulers like um, Hammurabi. Um, and so they were kind of like the new Babylonian Empire. Uh, their capital was Babylon, which we'll look at a map in just a second. Um, key rulers, Nebuchadnezzar, we'll talk about him, and also his son or successor, Belshazzar. Um, just if you ever read, another name for the Babylonians are the Chaldeans. Um, those are one and the same. And they are famous for uh, producing one of the wonders of the, of the ancient world, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Um, they also had renowned astronomers, and we'll dig into each of those topics in just a minute. Again, if, depictions of, their, of, their, of Babylon, you can see the ziggurat structure, um, all built upon that. They, they wrote in cuneiform. They were just an extended... Um, you know, built upon the backs kind of of, again, the Sumerian and then even the Assyrian cultures. Uh, slightly different empire. Again, you can see they had a different capital. Their capital was down in the south along the Tigris River, Babylon, right in the middle of, of uh, modern day Iraq. Um, they also, you're going to see, they actually are able to conquer the promised land. They even conquered Judah. Notice now Judah and Jerusalem are inside of the Babylonian empire. Um, however, they're, they're not in control of Egypt anymore. So whether you want to debate they were bigger or smaller, technically they might have been a little smaller, but it's close. Uh, modern day renditions of what we think the Hanging Gardens along the banks of the uh, Euphrates River looked like. Absolutely beautiful monumental palaces and temples um, with terraced platforms in which they could, um, again, grow gardens. Um, uh, visitors to the Babylon were absolutely in awe of their architecture and their beauty. Another potential depiction of what they looked like. And again, this is along the riverbanks. Um, Babylon, uh, for a long time, was one of the most powerful cities in all of the ancient world, even after the Babylonians fall, as we'll see. Um, another thing they're famous for are the astronomical records. Um, they were very, had very left behind, again, you can see the cuneiform script, um, in uh, uh, extensive uh, notes on the positions of stars and planets. They were able to predict uh, correctly eclipses um, and a lot of Western or Greek um, astronomy is based upon coming across the records of these Babylonian astronomers. It's also significant that we have this evidence and again it is it says in Daniel 2 that it was Nebuchadnezzar went to first to his astronomers to explain his dream of his statue. Um, however, like the uh, uh, the magicians of Egypt and Pharaoh, um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's astronomers were unable to make the prediction. Another interesting uh, connection between the Babylonian astronomers is that, again, we're going to talk about in a minute that Babylon um, Babylon uh, exiles the, the, the people of Jerusalem, and they're in captivity for 70 or 80 years, and a lot of Jews actually resettle in Babylon, Daniel being an example of that, um, Esther being another one. Uh, but that uh, when we read about the wise men in the East in, this, in the gospel stories related to Jesus' birth, um, predicting his his the star over Bethlehem and coming from the east to honor him, many people hypothesize that those are remnants of the Jewish exiles still living in the east over in Babylon, because you can see uh, Babylon is east of of Jerusalem, and that it was potentially Jews in exile. The three the wise men, uh, whether or not there were not necessarily three of them, the Magi might have been um, ex you know descended from the Babylonian astronomers, and again their incredible uh, record keeping and watching of the skies. Just a potential connection. Um, but again, uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, they succeed where Sennacherib and the Assyrians fail. They also lay siege to Jerusalem in 586, um, and they succeed. Um, this is where you read the prophet Jeremiah, who comes after Isaiah, and they're kind of, again, saying the people of Jerusalem are like, hey, just like you saved uh, us against Sennacherib, uh, you're going to save us again. But this time, Jeremiah delivers the bad news and says, no, you guys have become so debased. You've so broken the covenant. I'm going to have to send you to exile, and so there's no saving you this time. Um, and Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, they destroy the walls of, of Jerusalem, they burn the city, and they destroy uh, Solomon's temple. They take the Ark of the Covenant and all the treasures of, of the temple, and they remove them, along with the people, to Babylon. 
But that's a key difference is they don't resettle them all throughout their empire and destroy their cultural unity. They take they basically create a Jewish um, or uh, enclave right in Babylon. And so although they lose their homeland under the Babylonians, the Jews are still able to maintain their culture and their beliefs. Um, they just have to do so in exile over in Babylon. And that's different. And so uh, we don't have the same threat of the Babylonians because of how they dealt with them of, in terms of destroying their uh, their Jewish culture and, again, the, the Jewish um, uh, testimony and the Torah. Uh, the Jews are in exile for approximately 80 years in Babylon. Uh, this relief is depicting the, the exile as they carry the accoutrements of the temple and make the mar long march um, through, along the Fertile Crescent to Babylon. Um, they are in exile under the Babylonians. Um, during that exile, the, a new empire is going to rise, as we'll talk about in just a moment, the Persians. Um, and actually, many people see the fact that, again, it's like a discipline. God's not trying to destroy his people. He's trying to discipline them because he's going to keep up his side of the, of the covenant promise. Um, but it's during this exile when... Uh, that a lot of Jewish identity actually gets stronger. You read the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel, where in the face of P Babylonian culture, they decide to be to really commit to uh, the Jewish law. And so they really, this is the kind of the ex first example of the Jews taking their covenant and being placed among uh, outsiders, Gentiles, and basically drawing a strong distinction between themselves and the other peoples and saying, you know what, we are going to maintain our covenant. We are going to be different and set apart and holy. Um, from everybody else. Uh, Babylon eventually falls. You can read that account in Daniel as well. It's the famous writing on the wall, uh, mini mini tekel u parsons, which means uh, it's a message to Nebuchadnezzar's son, Belshazzar, that he has been measured and found wanting. Um, uh, famously, during that feast, Belshazzar is using some of the sacred um, implements of the Jewish temple to have a carousing drunken party. And, you know, almost as a kind of a final offense to God, he takes the most holy things of the Jews. And again, he's just he's just defiling them. And he receives this message that you're going to be conquered. Your capital city of Babylon is going to be conquered in a night, um, which historically has been confirmed that Darius, a ruler named Darius and the Medes, uh, who are leaders of the Persians, they come and they sack uh, Babylon very quickly. In fact, it's there's a betrayal. And so they're, they're led into the city and are able to take it over very quickly. Again, historically documented and discussed, um, accounted in the in the biblical Old Testament book of Daniel. Um, and finally, that then ushers in the third major empire of this uh, lecture, and that is the Medio Persian Empire. Uh, their capital is a city, the city of Susa, um, and they have some key rulers: Darius the First, Xerxes, and Cyrus the Great. That I'll be talking about. Um, uh, the story of Esther takes place while the Jews are in exile under the Persian Empire. So after the Babylonians have been defeated, um, she many people believe the husband that she's she's a concubine for is in fact Xerxes. Um, and the other significance of the Persians is it's the Persians who are going to allow the Jews to go back home. Um, they're going to um, we'll talk about that in a minute, but they're they're, they're going to allow them to return from exile and rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. Uh, later, when we get to the Greeks, we'll be talking about the famous wars between uh, the Greeks and the Persians and the fact that eventually Persia would fall as per the statue that went from Babylon to Persia and then the Greeks. They're going to fall to the, the, the greatest Greek conqueror, Alexander. OK. Um, there's just a picture of the empire. You can actually appreciate it's much larger than either the Babylonian or the Assyrian Empire. They once again regain control of Egypt. Uh, they control all the promised land. They extend all the way through the east, through what is modern day Iran, um, up to, right up to the border of India. Uh, they rule parts of Afghanistan. Um, and if you look west, they actually they, they're able to conquer Turkey and begin to push in towards Greece. And that's going to become the source of um, conflict when we talk about the Greeks. Um, after we finish this unit. Uh, Darius was the leader of the, uh, of the Persians who conquer Babylon and usher in uh, their control of the Fertile Crescent. Uh, his, one of his successors was the famous Xerxes. If, hopefully you haven't seen it, but if you heard the story of the, uh, of the Spartan 300s and their battle at Thermopylae against the Greeks, he was depicted there. That's a picture from the film. Not very historically accurate. Uh, the statue on the right was probably somewhat closer to what he really, you know, at least a, a more accurate representation. Um, and then the last, the main other ruler we want to talk about is Cyrus the Great. Um, actually, going back, Xerxes will be important when we talk about the wars with the Greeks. 
um, and Darius as well. They both have their conflicts. But Cyrus will focus on for now because Cyrus comes after them, and he famously is the one who, that, who allows the Jews. He says he has a dream from the God of heaven. Um, and the God of heaven tells him to allow the peoples within his empire to worship freely. Um, and so this thing here is called the Cyrus Cylinder. And on it, it's a historical artifact that we'll look at right here. There's actually the president or one of the ex-presidents of Iran looking at the Cyrus Cylinder. So it wasn't really big, but it would basically, basically was this declaration that you can see transcribed here, basically saying, I am the great, I'm the king of all the world, and I'm going to allow uh, these other peoples to go out and um, return to their homes and worship freely. You can see that down at the bottom noted that he released the captives and returned prisoners to their homelands. He tolerated local religions and cult practices. So famously, God uses Cyrus of the Persians versus Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonians to allow them Jews to return, allow them to rebuild their homelands and allow them to return to open worship um, according to the Jewish covenant. Um, and at the end, it's under Persian rule and Persian allowance of returning home that we have the biblical books of Nehemiah and Ezra, uh, where the Jews return back first to rebuild Jerusalem's wall and then to rebuild a second, though much less majestic, um, temple for worship, uh, approximately five, around 500 BC. All righty. So a lot of, a uh, lot, a lot of, uh, history there. Hopefully you have some background in it. And again, if you watch that summary of the old testament in eight minutes you'll the latter half of that kind of recounts a lot of what i've described in this uh lecture but the big big takeaways are one the rise and fall of kingdoms are first of all foretold centuries earlier by daniel i think it's important to pause and appreciate that we have a text of daniel written in the 500s um bc that foretell the fall accurately the rise and fall of these different um uh, empires. And in fact, uh, there's another dream that he foretells in the book of Daniel that even in much greater detail goes into a lot of the, the political or the rise and falls of various rulers um, in, in the Middle East. Um, it's also significant that, again, as I said at the start of this lecture, it predicts the coming of a greater and more eternal kingdom not made by human hands. And that once again, the Jews are challenging the, the traditional notions of the ancient Near East saying, you know what? There aren't just different competing gods, and each god is for or, or representing a certain kingdom. Uh, the Jewish god, yes, he is the god of the Jews, but he's not just blindly winning all the battles for the Jews. In fact, he's the one who turns them over to Babylon. He's the one who turns them over to Assyria. He's the one who's going to discipline them. He's not after uh, grand statues and grand temples. He allows the temple to be burned. His goal is something different. His goal is an eternal, unmade kingdom that's not from human efforts, but from supernatural efforts. And that it's that kingdom that's going to come and shatter man's attempts to build their own kingdoms. And his kingdom, again, according to that dream, is going to fill all the earth. So that's really what we see here playing out in the rise and fall of these various nations. God is directing the nations. Nations and rulers are tools in the hands of God to carry out his ultimate purposes um, for his kingdom. Whether it's Pilate um, and Jesus, whether it's Cyrus and the dream to allow the Jews to restore, whether it is even Nebuchadnezzar says, the God of heaven told me, to come and destroy your city, Jerusalem. Um, and so, it's, it, again, we get a perspective. Looking at these nations, we get a better perspective of how, uh, according to the Jews, and again, kind of according to Western civilization, they view God's role um, with the nations, one of great influence, but again, with his ultimate uh, and eternal purposes. All righty. I hope you enjoyed that, and we'll be talking about this more this week. Uh, this is the last uh, topic before we begin our review this week, and Friday will be a, a celebration will be our first unit um, exam. And so, hallelujah, praise Jesus for that. Good thing God's in control. <laughs>